Um, and hopefully people will continue to filter in. Um, so thank you all very, very much for coming. I'm going to share my screen. We can kick this off. So this is the um, virtual poster session for the Mantle Dynamics and Imaging session. Uh, and thank you all very, very much for coming. And just to sort of reiterate the thanks to Casey and Kristen and Molly for organizing such a fantastic um, symposium. It's been remarkably really pleasant to be at, <laughs> I found, and had great engagement. So I think um, this seems to be a great tool to be using for, our, um, for these sorts of virtual conferences and uh, I'm really pleased to see everyone. So the format today will be, uh, we have only an hour. Um, so what we'll do is move a uh, lightning talk style through three minute overviews of all the seven um, poster presentations that we have in the session. And that will hopefully leave 35, 40 minutes for discussions. Um, during the session, I'd like you to please mute your, please keep yourselves muted. Um, and you can put comments into the chat uh, and then also we'll have a raise hand feature at the end so people can ask uh, questions. And if you put, com you can put comments into the chat while people are speaking, but we won't interrupt the lightning talks just to make sure we're moving through all of those. And I will try and moderate those comments and sort of ask them to the speakers um, at the end. And I'd just like to right now plug use of the online posters. Right, we don't have that long to chat right now, but of course the, we should be making the best of the virtual format. And one of the excellent features of that is that there are these online posters and you can go and view people's presentations uh, in detail and in full. And then you can leave comments, which are lasting uh, written comments, which uh, will hopefully spur great engagement going forward. So moving immediately to our lightning talks. First up is Josh Russell. Josh is a uh, postdoc at Brown University interested in the oceanic upper mantle, mid-ocean ridge processes, and the thermorheological evolution of the oceanic plates. He uses ambient noise and teleseismic surface waves recorded on OBSs to image upper mantle shear velocity and seismic anisotropy. And here is his slide. And Josh, uh, go for it. Three minutes. Sure. Thanks, Zach. Um, so for my poster, we're presenting some of the new work from the, the Young Orca experiment, which was located on about 40 million year old lithosphere. Um, this map on the bottom left. Uh, and consisted of 30 broadband OBS. And in terms of its size and sort of data quality, it's pretty similar to the NoMelt experiment, which was on slightly older oceanic lithosphere at around at about 70 million year old, years old. Um, and on the top left is just showing an example of the Rayleigh wave anisotropy that we observe, um, which is very clear from about five seconds period all the way out to 150 seconds period. And we use those data to invert for um, azimuthal anisotropy is a function of depth, with it, which is shown on the bottom. And here we're comparing young orca to no melt. And we find that in the lithosphere, uh, the young orca anisotropy is significantly weaker than that at no melt. Um, and in terms of the direction, it's parallel to fossil spreading in the lithosphere, um, only down to around 35 to 40 kilometers depth, at which point it rotates away um, towards plate motion, but then actually surpasses plate motion. So in the asthenosphere, the anisotropy at Young Orca is rotated both from plate motion and from no melt. Um, and no melt is actually rotated in the opposite sense relative to plate motion. So um, this sort of gives us an idea of kind of the lateral heterogeneity and anisotropy in the asthenosphere and sort of points towards um, small scale convection, either small scale, uh, either pressure den density driven. Um, and in the top right is showing shear velocity profiles at the two regions. And the fact that they are at different ages is kind of a unique opportunity to try and investigate how well our models, for example, have space cooling off. at predicting these. Um, and so in the sort of dashed dotted line is showing half space cooling predictions. And on the right is a what we're calling a conductive cooling signature, but essentially it's the old profile divided by the young. So it kind of accentuates the, um, the velocity differences beneath the plate. And when we do that, we find that the half space cooling predictions um, actually under predict what we observe by about 1%. And um, we can reconcile this by adding, um, by increasing the temperature at Young Orca or adding a little bit of melt, less than half a percent it looks like um, we would need. 
And this is conceivable given its uh, given its location near the Marquesas hotspot. So in that map at the bottom left, you can see the little magenta circle is the Marquesas hotspot, and it's only about 750 kilometers away. So sort of all together, um, these observations, I think, make a pretty strong case for um, some sort of small scale convection beneath this region. That's it. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so again, questions will, will be at the end. So moving swiftly on to Jim Garrity at Northern Arizona University. Jim's research focuses on using seismic imaging to probe the dynamics of Earth's upper mantle with an emphasis on direct constraints on deformation processes and mantle flow. And he calls himself an outspoken advocate for expanding opportunities for seafloor geophysical observation. Uh, Jim, take it away. But unmute yourself. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so my poster focuses on kind of trying to give a comprehensive overview of uh, this project that we called No Melt, which uh, Josh actually just referred to, the, this uh, OBS array um, southeast of Hawaii on old oceanic lithosphere, 70 million year old oceanic lithosphere. And this experiment was pretty unique in that we really were able to do a very comprehensive set of, of studies. And so the station distribution, the yellow, shows the broadband OBS uh, work that my group has focused on. But in addition, the, the green here is a little bit low resolution, but there's a, a active source refraction survey and uh, that was done associated with this using the Lanxeth. And it focused very much on mantle structure and mantle fabric associated with uh, with the structure at a higher resolution than we can do with the broadband work. And then the uh, orange dots are actually uh, long period magnetotelluric instrumentation that was put down. So we have um, a, an ability to bring together high resolution P wave imaging of the shallow portion of the lithosphere, uh, MT imaging of the conductivity structure of the lithosphere and the cenosphere, and then the broadband seismic constraints on the lithosphere. And there's been a number of this is this paper this paper the papers have been published over the last few years on this and there's a in the poster you can find a summary of that work if you're not familiar with it in the poster I really try to emphasize a couple of new results um, in particular combining the anisotropic constraints that we have from these various data sets is really truly unique and um, Josh has led a paper that we're going to be submitting shortly that that actually compares the detailed anisotropic structure to um, the kinds of, of estimates you can make from xenoliths and even you can estimate in laboratory data and directly compare that to laboratory deformation experiments. And we we make it the case that basically the deformation process is not the, the typically thought of uh, uh, A-type fabric that is produced by dislocation creep, but is likely the grain size sensitive deformation happening sort of at the boundary between, between uh, 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 dislocation creep and diffusion creep. So, dislocation grain boundary sliding is the term there. Um, we can estimate the total amount of strain in the system and it suggests, uh, yeah, it puts strong constraints on the overall state of stress and, and grain size uh, behavior that we that we would expect in this sort of seafloor spreading environment when this, this formate fabric was formed. So that's one new result. The second one is that we've now then tried to kind of bring together um, the constraints that have come in, in particular, to try to better understand the lithosphere, cenosphere boundary, and, the, and sort of the state of the lithosphere relative to the cenosphere. And I would encourage you to just come talk to me and look at the poster. But the bottom line is that the the, the characterization of both the, the attenuation structure and the velocity structure, and combined with our information on the fabric and how deep the the fabric associated with seafloor spreading goes relative to a cenospheric fabric all point to hydration and the dehydration boundary being a really important control on the overall rheological behavior of the system and then the geophysical characteristics that we're seeing from that. And so we're really emphasize, we're, we, we remain convinced that at some level, the, the hydration process is a really important process for, for controlling deformation processes in the mantle. We can't rule out the, the pro, pro, processes associated with melt, but I think that uh, in a lot of ways, our data suggests that they may be secondary compared, compared to hydration. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, so I'll introduce myself now. Um, I'm a structural seismologist who uses passive source broadband OBS and land data for crust and mantle imaging. I do 
to tomography, I think about anisotropy and attenuation with a focus on mid-ocean ridges, continental rifts, and the dynamics of the asthenosphere. And today I'm presenting some new work that Josh teed up nicely from our, the first body wave results from this young orca array deployed on roughly 14 million year old seafloor, in case you missed Josh's talk. Um, and this is in a place where we see these corrugations, these undulations in the gravity field. And so we conducted teleseismic finite frequency P wave tomography using data captured on both the vertical and also the differential pressure gauge components of these OBS instruments. And what we found is that there are significant velocity variations in the mantle in this particular location um, with uh, positive and negative uh, velocity anomalies of up to plus or minus about two and a half percent. And they're kind of drawn out into these uh, elongated uh, features in the mantle in this location. If I plot a cross section on here, you can see that there are these sort of cells of um, uh, hot colors mean slow um, differential uh, velocity values and cold colors mean um, fast structure. And you can see there's this sort of alternating pattern of, of slow and fast and slow and maybe back to fast, again, with a wavelength of roughly 200 to 250 kilometers. And this, you know, we've done some squeezing tests and things on this, and this really appears to, to be required by the data to be in the asthenosphere between about 150 and 300 kilometers depth. And if I compare this velocity uh, structure, where here I'm taking the average deviation in velocity between 300 and 200 kilometers depth, where slow is up on this figure. Um, and I compare that to the topography in blue or the gravity in orange here, you can see that the patterns look rather extraordinarily similar from you know, completely independent data sets, obviously. Um, and what we think is going on here is that we actually have uh, small convective cells within the asthenosphere beneath this plate and that we have, um, there are these uh, hot um, ascendant cells that are seismically slow but prop up the plate above them and so you get a bathymetric and topographic um, sorry, bathymetric and gravity high, and then there are descending cold cells, which are seismically fast, and so you get bathymetric and, and gravity lows. And this is, you know, really exciting. This is, uh, in our view, the possibly the first evidence to, to validate um, long-held theories and ideas about what small-scale convection in the oceanic or beneath the oceanic plates could look like. Um, and I'll point out that the elongation of these features, and they're just south of of east and just north of west direction is essentially the same as, or at least very similar to the direction of the Pacific plate motion in a known net rotation frame, as well as being, <clears throat> as Josh just showed, uh, very similar to the direction of fast anisotropy seen in radio waves. And so this is kind of redolent of these ideas, going back to Roger Buck and Marc Palmentier and, and others, that you can have these small scale convective features in the asthenosphere beneath plates that are drawn out into these cylinders by the action uh, of the, the moving plate above them. So very excited to, to discuss this in detail with you going forward. But no time for that now. We will move on to our next talk, which will be a virtual talk from Takeshi Akuhara, who's been working with OBS at uh, Tokyo University, who's been working with OBS data to decipher subsurface structures, mostly through receiver function analysis, um, and who's also been working, not shown here, on techniques to deal with noisy OBS data and I will play this talk now. Hi, I'm Takeshi Akara from the University of Tokyo, Japan. I am really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to join this nice symposium virtually from Japan. Unfortunately, a huge time difference doesn't allow me to join this live session, but I'm really looking forward to seeing your responses. So if you have any questions or comments on my study, please feel free to contact me through chat or email. Anyway, today I'd like to talk about the lithosphere atmosphere boundary. So what we call LAB means the Sea of Japan back basin. So the study identify the LAB depth using SLC bar function, which give us a new constraint on the evolution process of the Sea of Japan. So here we see a map showing the study region. The study region can be divided into some tectonic domain like Yamato Basin, Yamato Rise, and Japan Basin. And we also have a broad band ocean but not size of meters, which is um, represented by red squares in this map. And here what we're seeing is S receiver functions stacked and depth converted at each station. 
The blue color means negative polarities of converted phases, so they are indicative of this sphere atmosphere boundary. So interestingly, the LAB deepened only beneath the Yamato rise. Now for more quantitative interpretation of that, we perform trans-dimensional inversion of S receiver function. So it nicely predicts the LAB depth. For example, in this case, we see it is located at the 45 km depth. So finally, we give a tectonic implication briefly. So the second lithosphere beneath the Yamato rise suggests that it is a continental fragment. In contrast, the thin lithosphere beneath the basin seems well suited to back up straight back arc spreading. Thank you. Right, some beautiful uh, OBS receiver functions right there. Um, so moving on to our next lightning talk, if you would let me, uh, which is going to be uh, by Joe Burns, who's a postdoctoral scholar at Northern Arizona University. Uh, whose work focuses on passive source body wave imaging of the upper mantle. Joe, are you around? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Awesome. My video is not working, so you all have to try to extrapolate what I look like from my voice. But I'm going to talk about some work today that is not actually from stations that were deployed underwater, but if we left them out for a few more million years, they would be underwater soon. So the I think the results speak to mid-ocean ridge dynamics, even though we're using land stations. I'm going to talk about some imaging we did in the Salton Trough, which is the northernmost part of the extension that you see in the Gulf of California on the west coast of the North American continent. And we're working with seismic attenuation. This is part of a larger project to measure the attenuation of teleseismic P phases. And an array that was deployed in the Salton Trough gave us a pretty unique opportunity to try to do higher resolution imaging than we, we normally do. Attenuation with body waves in particular is quite difficult, but the Salton Trough Seismic Imaging Project deployed stations with a very dense station spacing for broadband data and down to about five kilometers in many parts of the trough, which is a lot denser than we get in many land stations, but certainly denser than we get across most of the deployments at mid-ocean ridges. So we have a point of extension in a place where mid-ocean ridge-like basalts are being produced. Those are erupted in the salt and trough. And so we have an opportunity to try to image things with pretty high resolution and do the attenuation that we've been working on in my uh, group in Minnesota. And that array is shown here on, on the left in the figure. And then on the right is the result that we get for attenuation where warmer colors are stronger attenuation. The black line is a discontinuity that is used as a priori information in the inversion. Uh, it's the LAB from a receiver function study in the area. And what we found is that there is very strong attenuation in the upper mantle of the Salton Trough where the lithosphere has been thinned. And what we find that we think is most interesting and most related to mid-ocean ridge dynamics is that we get not just strong attenuation, but we get attenuations very strong in a very sharply bounded cell that gets narrower with increasing depth. And if you come to the poster, I can show that those features are all really well resolved. Things like the narrowing as it gets deeper and the amplitude are all, all, all quite well known for the study. And so what we interpret this as, as dynamic upwelling. We think this is an image of actual dynamic upwelling cell. We're not inferring uh, something from the shapes. There's a lot of imaging in uh, Juan de Fuca, where there's good evidence for dynamic upwelling and downwelling at the sides. Uh, but in this case, we're able to get a, a detailed image of, the, of what we think is the actual cell that's upwelling beneath the point of volcanism on the surface. And the key evidence for that being that we have strong attenuation that's not diffuse or uh, it's not getting wider as it gets down in depth and it's not getting weaker as you go down. I think you have to have, so I can show in the talk and if you come in the poster, if you come see me, uh, compare this with geodynamic models, this looks quite a lot like what uh, studies like uh, from Parmentier's models of upwelling the slow spreading bridges would look like if buoyancy forces are contributing to flow. Uh, and I can show you know, resolution tests and stuff like that at the poster if you come talk to me. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, Joe. Um, and again, there'll be time for questions at the end. So next is uh, Tolu Oluboji, um, who leads the computational seismology and geophysics group at the University of Rochester. 
Um, he uses high performance computing and machine learning for high resolution subsurface earth imaging, uh, particularly working on extracting and interpreting data obtained in challenging data poor settings from marine environments uh, to sparse seismic networks on the African continent. Tolu, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zach. Can you all hear me? Good. Okay, so like I um, introduce you to uh, these I some of these ideas in my talk, I'm just going to highlight them again here. And I'll obviously take feedback if you have feedback and uh, questions about any particular issue um, identified in my talk. This is essentially work done by my uh, student Evan and I um, looking at how we can essentially try to constrain a particular kind of noise source, uh, which is signal generated noise, so earthquakes that you record on the bottom of the seafloor, but uh, essentially reverberate within a sediment layer. That's what you're seeing on the left there, um, at, or inside a, a water column. The last time I did receiver functions in marine environments was both a pleasant and an unpleasant experience. Pleasant in the fact that we thought we got good results, unpleasant because I had to respond to criticisms about receiver function observations uh, being severely contaminated by sediments. So I took a vacation, took a break, uh, got a new job, hired a student and told him he was gonna solve it. He was naive enough to uh, address that problem. And we think here, we've been at least made some progress with identifying the signature of sediment reverberations and correcting for them. So what you see there is the equation governing sediment reverberation, what, we, what, I'm, what I'm expressing as the singing of sediments. Uh, singing of sediments is just earthquake waves trapped in some waveguide. <clears throat> multiply reflected um, and the uh, equations governing that uh, uh, singing reverberation is given by the reflection coefficient of the bottom of that layer and the delay time the waves um, uh, accumulate within that layer. So if you can uh, model that behavior, that's what's shown as the reverberation effect that looks like a comb filter by designing an appropriately matched D reverberation filter, that's the notch filter there, you can hopefully uh, silence the singing of the sediments. And so that's the analytical expression of um, how those effects work. And in the next slide, I show how we uh, perform controlled experiments. Uh, oh, there's only one slide. Well, oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, this, uh, uh, this is how we design and apply that to uh, actual data. I got maybe about a minute. Uh, on the top is uh, our waveforms of what uh, waveforms collected from the no melt experiments. On the horizontals in the blue and black uh, seismograms, you see what the reverberation looks like in the time domain. And the bottom slide, uh, uh, what they look like in the spectral domain. In the spectral domain, they um, look like essentially what I showed in analytical expressions, essentially resonances at the uh, fundamental frequency governed by that equation f of n. If you look in the time domain, they just look like constructive interference, constructive interference of waves trapped uh, within that layer, almost like a uh, you know, beating phenomenon, if, you, if you'd, if you'd uh, like to uh, characterize it as that. When you design a proper filter to match um, the reverberation effect, a de-reverberation de filter, you can improve detection of lithospheric structure, which we do, and uh, which I identify in my slides, and I can uh, take questions about the details of that. The future application will be to improve uh, filter design uh, using empirical estimates from spectra. Uh, we're applying that in the Alaska experiment at the moment. Thank you. Fantastic, thanks Tola. I'm glad I put the second slide in there. Um, next up, uh, our final presenter before we move to questions is Yuan Nguyen, who's a PhD student at uh, Rice University, whose research focuses on understanding the geodynamical processes behind the evolution of the lithosphere, uh, who has worked with geophysical methods that involve potential field and also seismic data. So Luan, walk us through your poster. All right, thanks, yeah. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, so. Uh, in this study, we look at the Gulf of Mexico basin, and since the late Triassic, this area have undergone uh, several different uh, processes of either continental rifting, uh, sea floor spreading, and then the eventual passive margin or thermal subsidence. And so we thought that this would be a good opportunity for us to 
uh, not only investigate about the uh, evolution of how the lithosphere evolved, but also the de development of the oceanic lithosphere. And uh, another motivation for us is that we would like to um, constrain our understanding of the uh, tectonic history of this uh, regional uh, basin. And so uh, uh, the method that we use in, in this study is uh, just um, ambient noise surface wave or Rayleigh wave cost correlation. And I use all the data uh, surrounding the Gulf of Mexico basin. I don't have the, uh, the station location here, but if you refer to my talk, um, so basically we use all of the station uh, from the US Air Raid and uh, the Mexican uh, station network as well as some, uh, a dozen of stations in the Cuban region and try to do cost correlation to extract the, uh, uh, the surface wave, uh, relay wave travel time uh, through the Gulf of Mexico area um, and try to build a 3D shear wave velocity. And so uh, based on the velocity model that we were able to calculate from this, uh, there's a couple of uh, key findings that I like to highlight. Uh, here is that um, using the, um, the shear wave velocity and the crustal thickness derived from that as well as the depth to the LAB derived from the shear wave velocity, we were able to map out different area of uh, oceanic lithosphere versus uh, highly extended uh, continental lithosphere as well as uh, area of the continent that, has, uh, that hasn't been uh, extended uh, severely. And uh, we, also, we also saw that uh, over the area of highly extended lithosphere, we observe a, uh, in the lower lithosphere, uh, there's an, a region of reduced shear wave velocities. And we attribute this area um, to, be, um, to be caused by uh, extensional deformation uh, that was sustained during the period of continental rifting. And when we compare the thickness of the mantle lithosphere in this area uh, versus the crustal thickness, we saw a contrast uh, in terms of um, uh, extensional rate. And that's uh, make us interpret this area as, um, as if the lithosphere has been able to uh, regain its thickness due to thermal cooling uh, after breakup. And we also saw there's a, a um, a spatial variation in terms of reduced velocity in the lithosphere as we go from the western margin toward the eastern margins. Uh, and this, uh, this is consistent with the uh, present uh, understanding that uh, seafloor spreading started in the, uh, in the western Gulf of Mexico before it propagated toward the eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Luan. So uh, we'll now move into the question answer discussion um, part of this sessions with with half an hour um, and just a few reminders, please raise your hand or put questions in the chat and you can use a little at sign to direct them to someone and I'll, I'll uh, keep breaking in and moderating those. Um, please make sure that you're asking questions comments are fantastic, but that's what the um, the meeting app is for you can leave comments on people's posters there and please be mindful as always of how much space you're taking up this is a, a short session okay so i will actually sh stop sharing my screen so we can see each other a little better and um please raise your hands for questions you can use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your zoom if you go into reactions there's the option to raise your hand so dianti Dianti, you're muted. Sorry. Hi, I wrote my question in chat, but if you want, I can just say it. Um, um, I sure. I guess I am so excited about your results, Zach. <laughs> That's so interesting and exciting to see some uh, actual tomography of these features. But I just wanted to ask if. You've considered the viscous fingering model. Uh, we've been delayed on this publication, but it is coming soon. Um, but essentially our results show that the wavelength of fingers scales with a channel thickness as 4B. And so if you're seeing 200 or 250 kilometer 
lineations that would, I would ask if you could find, or do you see any kind of a stenospheric channel thickness that's around 50, 60 kilometers with an error? And if so, you might consider mentioning this as a possible model in addition to small scale convection, because it's a really interesting results. And I'm, I apologize to the community for delaying this publication. There have been several issues with not the publication, not the results in getting this out. So um, I'm happy to also uh, share further later explaining and showing you some of the actual details. So I, I would love for the two of us to connect over that uh, to quickly answer your question. We're definitely thinking about viscous fingering. If you uh, have a look at the poster uh, proper, you, I um, carefully cited your 2007 paper. And I think it's, it's a very, you know, it's something to keep in mind. I actually want to bring in Josh maybe on the question of what the possible depth of that asthenospheric channel could be. From the body wave tomography perspective, we don't have the resolution to tell anything more than it has to be deeper than 100 and shallower than 300 to actually 250 is what is required. But Josh, maybe you... Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, um, well, <laughs> yeah, it'd be great if I could like show a slide, but basically the um, the, the place in our model where half space cooling doesn't appear to do a great job of explaining the velocity, uh, the, the low velocities below the lithosphere at Young Orca. Yeah, so this sort of top right panel. Um, yeah, so I was actually, I was thinking more about the top, the top right. So you were, I guess, Anthony, you're um, you were saying it would be like 60 kilometers below the lithosphere. Is that what where the? Yeah, but it there's several possibilities like a standard asthenosphere or you know the Parmentier and uh, older model of a <clears throat> of a thin channel in the lithosphere in the asthenosphere. And I can explain the possibilities later. But um, yeah. I guess my second question, which I'm jumping in here, is to some of the tomography people is, I don't see, I was wondering if you can estimate depth errors when you're using Rayleigh waves, because I know those are pretty large at long periods. I see your errors in velocity and isotropy, but I don't really see depth errors on these publications. So I don't know if that's a possibility to include. Yeah, I would say that the depth, that's <laughs> never actually, that's like one, one aspect of our modeling that I think we could do a little bit better on is exploring the depth sensitivity in particular for the low velocity zone and like exactly how deep that needs to be as as you could see from that figure that zach sort of circled there's a big discrepancy in terms of where that low velocity zone is from the predictions and what we observe um, but i don't think it can i don't think we can make our low velocity zone quite as shallow as the like half space cooling models would like so uh, but it would be interesting to see just how. Oh, so the location of it is so, less important so I, as the I, total I, thickness. I actually, I want to bring in maybe also Luan, and then maybe Jim will also possibly have a comment on this. But Luan, you, you've been doing the Rayleigh wave imaging, and um, I'm interested by sort of the constraints that you think you have on that oceanic MAB that you showed us. And I think this this relates to Dianti's question. Yes. Uh, can you? So from, from my model in the, uh, the LAV were calculated as the, uh, the maximum negative gradient of the velocity of the velocity field. And how towards so Dianti's question, how good do you think some of your vertical constraints on that are? Yeah, that is, uh, that's a good question and I like, I think we can all agree that the Rayleigh wave, the vertical resolution is not great. And I think the best we, we, we can have confidence in is probably on the order of 25 to above 20 kilometer in, uh, in vertical sense, I think. But um, what I wanna point out is that, yeah, the, the absolute value of the, the depth might be questionable, but we, we see a, a consistent regional trend in terms of you know different tectonic area have a consistent trend of where the LAB is. And I think that's, that is important. For example, if we continue to see area of oceanic crust 
have a shallow LAB across the whole region. And we compare that to the region of um, uh, highly extended uh, continental or slightly extended continental. Uh, the pattern we see is consistent throughout the whole study area. And that kind of give us more confidence in, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the model versus just you know, uh, looking at the, the absolute depth of the LAB. I don't, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but uh, Luan, what's the wavelength of your features? Are they similar to Zach's wavelength? 200 kilometers? Um, yeah, the wavelength in terms of the, I'm sorry, what, what, what wavelength? Well, it looks like you have some lineated alternating features in there. Are you, maybe not. You're just talking about velocity. All right. So That's I want fine. to bring maybe. in I want to bring in Jim as well in, in case or give Jim the opportunity to comment if he if he would like to. And then Brandon's been waiting very patiently for a question. Jim, you're muted. I, I mean, yeah, just real quickly, I think there's kind of two issues that I would point to in trying to resolve kind of the depth range where this action is happening. And one is how effectively we can control the transition from the lithosphere to the sphere or understand that transition. And it's clear that, you know, that's kind of the resolution length scale of 25-ish kilometers or something that we see a transition happening over that, you know, we probably can't do any, we can't distinguish between that and something that's much more sharper from surface waves alone. And that's where things like the receiver functions bring in important constraints. So, but, but I think it is clear that we can resolve within that 25 kilometer range, we do clearly see, for example, the young orca versus no melt comparison. You'd clearly see velocity differences that we can resolve those differences as being important in that, in that sort of 100 kilometer depth range. I think what we're really sort of just kind of getting our handle, uh, heads around now is if we wanna to try to better understand the low velocity zone as a channel and the asthenosphere as a channel, what does the bottom of that look like? And I think we have really poor constraints on that. The surface waves we're, with, with compliance corrections, we're able to push our surface wave observations out to 160 seconds period. So we nominally have sensitivity down there, but there's a lot of trade-offs. And so, you know, really being able to distinguish the depth extent of that kind of low velocity feature that you might call the asthenosphere, I think is really an open question. And, and, and sort of how that, I think one of the things we really then want to do is compare, get good constraints on that low, low velocity zone structure from the surface waves, but then really do the squeezing tests on Zach's body wave imaging to try to, that takes into account the depth range where we think the, the large scale, the largest variations are likely to be and see whether that can help us sharpen up the body wave images. Because as, as Zach said, it really is clear that they're in the asthenosphere, and in some ways, the tests he's done so far suggest it's deep in the asthenosphere. This isn't happening right beneath the plate. It's actually, you know, sort of in the in the two hundred to three hundred kilometer depth range. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Brandon, please unmute yourself. And yes. Ask a uh, thanks. Those are all fantastic talks. Um, my question is for Josh and Jim. I think it's uh, really awesome to see all the new great constraints that are coming out on uh, the orientation and depth and strength of anisotropy in these settings. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about the comparison uh, on inferring these rock fabrics in comparison to laboratory data. I think someone had mentioned um, comparing these sort of things to xenoliths and I know that often xenoliths come from these crazy places and they're modified significantly on their way to the surface. So I was wondering if we have really good samples from uh, these ocean basin settings and if you could comment a bit more about the reliability of inferring uh, specific mineral fabrics from these anisotropic signatures. Uh, it's on my poster, so I will answer only to say we can come and talk to, around my poster for the actual direct answer. I'll, Josh is the one who did the, the primary work, so Josh can kind of give you the, the, the short answer here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really great question. Um, and yeah, as you know, the, a lot of the abyssal critotites are coming. Yeah, they're sort of pulled up from oceanic settings. And then one of the biggest issues is actually orienting them in the in the reference frame, like what's the, what is the horizontal shear axis for this sample that you just pulled up? Um, so for, for more directly inferring kind of the, so you can get, there are ways to do that. And I'm not exactly the person to talk to about how that's done, but there are ways to get those orientations and to sort of estimate, um, yeah, the fabric type, the, 
the sort of alphabet soup of fabrics or whatever. But some of, I think, um, some of the even better observations are from shear zones like the Josephine, uh, for example, or um, other ophiolites. And from those, you can actually get estimates of strain and you sort of know based on how they've deformed, you sort of know what the shear orientation was and things like that. Um, but the caveat there is that you then probably have a pre-existing fabric from when that material actually went into the, the shear zone. So um, one of the key parts of, of the work that Jim was referring to is using the laboratory data as well as like a, another kind of proxy for what's going on and how these fabrics are actually developing. Um, because yeah, like like you said, there's the there's composition and there's like the setting and, and you have to get the, the orientation of the shear zone right and things like that. So there are certainly uncertainties that go into it that are associated with the natural fabrics that the lab data do a little bit. Um, you can sort of get get by with. I don't know if that answers <laughs> your question exactly, but <laughs> no, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I appreciate it. And definitely seems like we're making a lot of progress and with the more observations that we have, we'll be able to tease out more about, I guess, yeah, trying to think about more about whether we can reliably infer, um, you know, things like stress, strain and tectonic uh, scenarios from uh, comparisons between observations and laboratory data. But it sounds like we're getting a lot closer to that. Yeah. Thanks. questions no one else has one i have one for tolu um i was wondering how you design the so you, you said you design the um that sedimentary um reverberation quieting filter i presume it's there's some sort of penalty function that you minimize where you identify the feature of the or the signature of that ringing and you're trying you're solving for the sedimentary parameters that that quiet that so how does that work and how do you take into account heterogeneity in the sediments a perfect question so how do we design it we 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 just actually confirm what the property are properties of the filter are from actually synthetic experiments and also analytical arguments so that's been done early papers by bacchus and others uh, well actually bacchus himself in 1959 so for, for the uh, water situation. So we know uh, the case for water situation solved analytical, analytically. Uh, and we asked ourselves the question, what is it about the sediment reverberations that differ uh, from water reverberations? And when we looked at the analytical treatment, we reached the conclusion there's nothing at all. It is a waveguide like a water reverberation. Right? The reflection coefficients are high enough uh, to trap the waves. And so what we just needed to do was to solve the reflection for the reflection coefficient for an ocean model <clears throat> and compute the, the delay time. So for a synthetic case, we solved it completely and demonstrated that it works uh, completely. Now you get back to the issue, you're getting back to the concern of, okay, how did we do that for no melt and how do we proceed on to do it for any other station we might uh, encounter, in particular for amphibious surveys where the structural sediment might vary significantly. For no melt, thankfully, uh, the uh, no melt group, group uh, Jim Gary, uh, Lee Pia, and others. Um, spectacular work across all spectrums, uh, shallow uh, down to the mantle. So we've got good constraints in the sediment structure. So we're able to um, use those sediment properties to design the filter, but also confirm in the data based on the functional form spectra, uh, convincing ourselves that the properties that we've designed uh, match. Again, let me emphasize reflection coefficient. And you can get that from Aki, the Aki papers, you know, just you know, compute reflection coefficient S down going, S up going, kind of thing like that, or S, S up going, that kind of thing. Uh, so in any case, you get the reflection coefficient in delay time and the filter works, we think uh, improves the detection of lithosphere conversions. So in your case, I think, yes, you're right. What we will probably have to do is do some kind of uh, optimization where you're tuning the filter properties and asking yourself the question, can I look for some uh, optimization constraint to uh, convince the algorithm that it has found uh, an appropriate filter? And that's something that is ongoing work that we are working on, in particular for the Alaska experiments. So to uh, take the uh, 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 the uh, signal processing one step further, and to guide the filter based on some kind of optimization constraint. Two that readily pop uh, into my mind, into our mind, is just look at the spectra, design some misfit function between the predictor frequencies and the observed frequencies, 
Uh, and the other that might pop up, I say, okay, uh, do some Bayesian analysis, a, prior, a priori assumptions of what cost of fixing should look like, and posterior, posterior assumptions uh, on your, recurve, your recurve, recovered cost of structure. And if there is, a, uh, if there is a information gained from prior to a posteriori, then you are, then you are improving the data quality uh, within, the, within the context of the parameters for the filter. So that's how we're proceeding. Um, I'm open to hearing uh, ideas, and I'm sure this is again open area for uh, any other researcher to kind of explore. As we look at body waves, um, looking at the code of body waves and trying to normalize source effects and improve uh, uh, conversions that uh, uh, high frequency can tell us something about high resolution, uh, long wave and the short wave structure of the upper mantle. Yes, yeah, strikes me that at least one of the parameters which would pre presumably be the sediment thickness is something that is intrinsically interesting and also could be compared from um, from compliance and other other um, sources so you know think about Sam Bell's I think it's 2014 2015 maybe paper and you could compare how these two methods actually ascertain or determine that sedimentary thickness yeah, and I imagine sedimentary properties yeah I imagine that that's something that people will start to do like, okay, see, just put everything within a joint inversion framework and see if you can even uh, improve that near first five, 10 uh, kilometers uh, where you're using compliance to improve sediments and you're using the sediments property to design the filter to improve resource functional estimates. You're perfectly spot on. Yeah. So I wanna bring Joe into this conversation as well. Um, and again, I really encourage questions from the audience, but um, as long as people aren't sticking up their hands, I can keep asking. Sounds good. But so Joe, looking at your post, I was kind of interested. I hadn't noticed this when I read your paper yeah. that you're sort of calling for high attenuation in a region where for a mid-ocean ridge, which is sort of what you're arguing the mantle looks like, right. you actually have relatively high um, velocity. Yes. So how do those two things go together? My my best guess for that is that they don't go together. So the velocities that we cite in the paper are what I think are the most appropriate to cite based on what's currently available. And they are from a surface wave study using only Raleigh waves that can be obtained from the ambient noise. So they get down to the, I don't remember the exact number, it's on the order of 30 to 50 seconds. And the model is only defined down to about 50 kilometers. And they see a very clear low velocity zone beneath the salt and trough where we see the high attenuation. Spatially, it agrees really nicely. But as you're pointing out, if you compare it to other mid-ocean ridges where there's surface wave and attenuation constraints, we have similar attenuation to the mid-ocean ridges, but higher velocities. And that's my guess is that it could be a resolution issue. I don't know that for sure, but you're looking at the edge of the, the surface wave model, they're getting the low velocity zone. And my guess is if you incorporate a longer period data into study of the salt and trough's velocities, you I would expect to see velocities drop down. If I remember right, the salt and troughs VS in this model is on the order of about 4.15. 4 uh, and it would come more into a line with mid-ocean ridges if it got down closer to about four kilometers per second with longer period data. Uh, as it stands, it's a bit of a, it is a bit of a paradox where it's hard to explain relatively high VS, but very strong QS. You would expect them either to go in tandem or the other way around. Uh, and because of that weird physical paradox there, I, I would expect that you would you could lower VS with further studies. Could it be some sort of radial anisotropy issue? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the other possibility. Is it absolutely could be. So one of the studies that's come out with that nice array is the SKS studies that show that you get a pretty strong increase in splitting times of SKS phases when you enter the trough. And you see a really strong rotation of the fast directions to almost parallel the San Andreas Fault. And so there's, there is some unique anisotropic body uh, in the upper, probably in the upper mantle uh, in this area. And so another, yeah, so the other possibility for the high VS is that it's an artifact of anisotropy that's not being resolved. The only Raleigh waves were used in the model I'm, I'm citing there. Also something to definitely to look at with further studies. Very interesting. And, and it's not like 4.15 is anomalously high. No, it's not. No, it's not exactly high. It's certainly a low velocity. It's certainly a low velocity zone where we see the high attenuation. Yeah, but I, I agree if you want to try to match the Q and the VS in a, in a physical way. It's a, it's a little bit higher than you would like to see to, to really try to explain it with, with laboratory models or compare it empirically to other mid-ocean regions. Not a very exciting answer, but that, that's my, probably my explanation for it. But it's a good point. It's, it's not high. I, I do, 
want to emphasize it is a low there is a low velocity zone where we see the high attenuation and, and it agrees roughly with the the contours we see spatially it's quite nice so i see colton has used the old-fashioned raised hand which is to unmute himself <laughs> i didn't colton, mean did you have a question that was uh, i forgot to mute myself when i said my bad. okay no worries hello um, colton <laughs> i totally any other question do we have any other questions from this uh, very knowledgeable and wide audience? Don, very nice to see you. Don, you're muted. I can try and unmute you. Okay. There you go. I have a comment on the uh, reverberation problem with in the sediments with um, the shear waves reverberating. There's a big problem with the large gradients and velocity you get within the sediment column. But very slow at the very surface where it's very unconsolidated, rapidly increasing velocity it makes it difficult to use really simple layered. Uh, models for that. Great question, Don. Um, a way to kind of look into that problem and identify the issues. Actually, I don't think I completely understand what set up, sets up that reverberation. Because even if you look at the, if you look at in detail the no melt array, the reverberation signature varies from, from station to station and from earthquake to earthquake. So my guess is there is some, some other complexity in there just like you've identified things like, okay, what, what if you've got a gradational uh, uh, velocity and things like that? So I think it's an open question, um, looking at the data and exploring um, what about the sediment properties, the way uh, um, difference from consolidated and unconsolidated sediment um, lead to the reverberations being set up and uh, designing an appropriate filter to remove it. But again, I, I am open to learning as much as you know, and. Uh, uh, continuing to continue this conversation either uh, during the post or offline um, over email or something like that where we can learn more about how to improve this uh, problem or improve our handling of this problem. Did I address your comments or do you want to follow up? No, I, I just, I think in practice it's going to be difficult for the S-way reverberations. You're right. You're right. And I am, and I'm agreeing with you hundred percent wholeheartedly because yes, even in the practice of a simple, uh, small aperture array, there is more complexity. You are right, Don. I just have a comment about Tolu's uh, work. Um, and that is just to say, we have the same problems with, well, I shouldn't say same, similar problems with the receiver functions for Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, because the, the P wave receiver functions, uh, a lot of the deeper structure is sometimes obscured by the reverberations in the ice layer. So, um, and so you have an ice sediment, you know, hard rock um, layering that, um, you know, that uh, causes problems for receiver functions. And I guess the other comment I would have is that if you have a lot of topography, I think that makes it difficult. Um, so like in the OBS case, if you have uh, seafloor topography, it's going to make the um, reverberations a lot more chaotic. Uh, you a very, a very good observation, Doug. Um, and even in the earlier treatments of this uh, uh, problem, uh, you know, again, when I say early in the 50s, 60s, uh, they gave the name the sinking of um, not the singing of sediments in this case, I think it's, it's water reverberation, the singing of water reverberations. There were earlier work um, by uh, physicists trying to even just look at what's the problem. I mean, what happens to the reverberation when you have topography, varying topography? And as you can imagine, the you know it makes the problem more chaotic. Things are not as simple. You know, if you think about a beautiful flute and you blow on it and you you know chug that flute up with crap, chaotic crap, it's not going to sing nicely. And if it doesn't sing nicely, you cannot tune for it, tune for the, uh, the adverse, adverse, I mean, uh, match, whatever. So when, when, when the problem gets chaotic, you know, it gets more challenging. Now for the no melt case, um, 
a small aperture array. Individual stations have will show some frequency, fundamental, second mode, whatever. But if you average it, the hope is that those um, complexities smooth out and the array sees some first order, one dimensional, say homogeneous behavior. And that's what happened in our case. I think that's what made no melt work. Is that gonna happen every, every time? I don't know. Uh, how do you do it for ice layer with topography? I don't know. I think it's open questions. Research might uh, be successful with looking at that problem. But again, it's an avenue for definitely we also look at and go back to the old analytical treatments, get some theoretical seismologists excited about it involved in the problem and see if we can improve detection of subsurface structure, like you've identified in marine environments and in, uh, in environments like in, um, in where we've got ice layer. The earth doesn't reveal its secrets easily and we will obviously <laughs> keep banging at the door until she says open sesame. Um, thank you. Thanks, Doug. Any other questions from the, uh, from the audience? We have one in the chat, um, but it's another one about the sedimentary reverberation. So I just want to give a chance for uh, us to ask about other things before we go to that one. I actually had a, a question for Luan, which is that I noticed in the model, the location where you have apparently the thinnest lithosphere is also we have the thickest crust, which seemed intriguing to me. Is that, did I get that correct? Uh, yes. But, um, that's correct, but um, the thickness of the crust is also include the one of the thickest sediment package in the area. So if we only look at the crystalline crust, then we can see that the crystalline crust in that area is highly extended by a factor of three. But the, the overlying sediment that make the crust look very thick. We have like 15 kilometers of sediment at that particular area. Got it, interesting. So Helen has a question, I think probably for Tolu, which is that do, to what extent do sediment reverberations require an abrupt basal boundary to give you the high amplitudes? What if it's more gradational at the base because of compaction, lithification, et cetera, I guess. And are there other problems <laughs> that we should be worrying about? Uh, simple answer is- Anything else to worry about? <laughs> There's always more to worry about. Simple answer is yes, yes, yes. Worry about it, worry about it, worry about it. And in the, you know, it's instructive to look at the analytical case, right? The analytical case says you can trap a layer if the reflection coefficient is, um, is it high? Yes, I think high. Essentially, if you've got like almost like a glass, you know, like a mirror, if you've got a mirror in your reverberate, it will reverberate uh, faster. If you, if you, that mirror gets a little fuzzy <clears throat> or disordered, then you're not reverberating. Uh, uh, as efficiently. So back to your question, yeah, if the velocities are gradational, I imagine you're not going to have as much reverberation. But again, that's a simple, simplistic uh, uh, assumption. Look at the data, check for the signature, uh, look at our complementary uh, observations and constraints, and see if you can place uh, uh, constraints on the velocity structure, and then uh, proceed with uh, what we know about how to design the filter and see if it improves. That's my, again, naive, um, you know, look at, at things. Um, you, you have to worry about everything. Um, um, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Toto. So uh, we are officially at the end of our time. It's 9.30 and I know that everyone has cleared their entire schedule for this uh, symposium. So you'll all be aware that in half an hour, there is the subduction poster session, which will be uh, last for another, uh, an hour and a half. Um, I think at some point this meeting will automatically close. I'm happy to stick around and I encourage any of you that would be interested in continuing this discussion to stick around now, but um, we've come to the official end of this session. So I'd just like to take a moment to thank all of our presenters. I guess I can clap. And um, to please remind you all to, to engage with these posters, right? This isn't just about the lightning talks and the discussion today. There are people who have taken the time to record um, sort of mini talks essentially and put up a bunch of poster slides or a full poster PDF. And so for ongoing interaction with those, please go to the 
um, the excellent symposium website and have a look, comment, um, and um, hopefully we can reap some of the benefits of this virtual format. So we will lose this session until the, uh, in eight minutes time. So we can have eight minutes of continued uh, discussion on here if people are interested. I would just encourage people to look at other people's posters that didn't have verbal presentations. They're listed for Monday, but uh, there's other related posters to this session. And I didn't Monday, even know about it, this. It's even you. Monday, not next Monday, but the following ah. Monday, which I didn't even realize was part of the scheduled meeting. So yeah, so so, so two weeks from now, of, at the very end of the agenda are all, a whole bunch of posters. So yeah. Go okay. Check yeah. Uh, so yeah. noon Eastern, nine a.m. Pacific on Monday, the twenty-second yeah. is open posters. How long will the uh, posters and the videos and everything be online, um, so that we can continue to interact with it over time and, and you know chat with people or and set you know set up follow up email. Uh, Molly or Kristen or Casey. Um, they will be online for one year. Well, so everything will be up for a year. Cool. So, and March and 10th, I guess I have a question. Slash comment. I guess it, the best way to actually interact with posters is through the chat function on the page associated with each poster. So we're the first poster session, I guess. So there's not. Yeah. So there's a, there's a few ways to interact. You can chat and thereby leave comments. Presenters can, and some of us have, also establish what are called polls, where you can ask a specific question to people in, that are engaging and they can either vote on those if they're multiple choice or they can be sort of short format answers. So um, try and use all of those. Sessions recorded also for a year. So and if you guys really wanna get in depth about something, you can use a platform to schedule a private or a small group meeting. Okay, so we have six minutes before we get kicked off. So beyond our official time but if anyone has other questions it'd be great to hear them i'm just going to send a shout out to some people i know <laughs> <laughs> you can do that as well this is unofficial time tell you you can do what you want hello liam <laughs> hi to <Tolo. laughs> <laughs> I think also Emily's Zoom background deserves a shout out because it's I think the best of anyone's that I've seen. And Emily, um, maybe you maybe you have a question because you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I, I did. I have a question that I feel is stupid, so I uh, hesitate to type it in the chat. But I guess I'm I'm looking at all these posters, and I thought Jim made it really clear that um, the uh, tectonic plate is more controlled by a dehydration boundary than by um, you know, thermal cooling model. And I guess I'm, I'm sort of trying to figure out, is that true of these other results as well? Or you know, how, how consistent is the general feeling right now that that's the case? And I didn't watch the talks that were at 1 a.m. So I'm hoping I can see those recorded. I think the, yeah, I, it's clear that there's a lot of competing effects and it makes sense that there would be. And, and in particular, it's important to remember that thermal, many of these processes that we talk about as being water and or melt, obviously they very much depend on temperature, including a hydration process is a thermally activated process. And so it's, it's most active both in a rheological framework at higher temperatures. It very likely, we don't really understand very well the seismic response, for example, of, of water, but it's likely, uh, it's likely also thermally active clearly the conductivity response of the water is thermally activated. So it's, it's not, we don't want to overemphasize the fact that it's not thermal. The thermal boundary layer is part of it, but I think it's clear that the geophysical observations for a long time have shown that it's not just a thermal boundary layer and there's something else going on. There's something else contributing it, to it. The melt versus water, um, you know, kind of hypothesis has been around for a long time. And in a lot of ways they interact with each other. The, there's difficulties with both of them and that the experimental evidence for water is really hard to find. But at the same time, the amount of melt that you can have around, you sort of have to have this sweet spot that you're not having a really big effect on the connectivity. Once you interconnect the melt, you're gonna blow up the connectivity and the connectivity, at least in many of the places we've looked in the old ocean basins, don't blow up. 
And so it, you need to have limited amounts of melt for the conductivity, but you have to have enough to therefore have a seismic effect, which is generally thought to be enough to be interconnected and so significant. And so it's balancing those two sweet spots that I think people are trying to figure out and, and in, important mechanisms like water changing the deformation mechanisms like Curato and, and, and Tolu have proposed are the kinds of things that we're now thinking about to try to make all this kind of fit together. Just following on on that, um, some work that I'm not showing at this symposium using that young orca data, we've actually done P wave receiver function imaging, which again is done by my student Lun, um, that seems to, well, the, the, the reason I'm not presenting it is because it's a little bit ambiguous. And that's because as Tolu well knows, there are issues with water reverberations showing up in your receiver functions. And it just so happens that the depth at which um, we deploy these instruments produces a water pulse at around six ish seconds after the primary arrival. And we see a, a negative anomaly, which could either be that water pulse or could be um, an actual negative velocity gradient from the P wave data at around five and a half seconds. So we're still kind of on the fence as to whether we can believe this at all or if it's a complete artifact. But if it's real, then it says that there is some sort of fairly sharp negative velocity gradient because we're seeing in relatively high frequency P wave receiver functions. So like I said, the jury is kind of still out on that. And I don't know if we're going to be able to resolve the difference between those, but it's, it's another kind of piece in this puzzle. And I would just say that it's a, if you migrate it to depth, you get something like 50, 55 kilometers, which is exactly the same depth in that location where Nick Schmer's SS precursors um, argue that there is a negative velocity gradient at the base or within, uh, let's say, in the oceanic lithosphere. Uh, so just to echo the um, summary by uh, Jim, I, I think the plates are the plates because they are thermally activated. Um, uh, so on long time scales, when I say plates, plates is a long time scale phenomenon as plate tectonics uh, theory suggests. So it's a thermal, thermal, thermal feature. Now the paradox comes in when we try to interpret seismology and when we're looking at short wavelength behavior, uh, some of the resolution of these paradoxes like Jim has identified is to just uh, see what we understand about how the full thermodynamic states of the uh, upper mantle, lower mantle uh, fit into how they how to, I mean, fit in with our uh, explanation of seismic velocities. But then regardless, we, we realize that a lot of these mechanisms are again thermally activated. Is there a role for water? You bet there's a role for water, uh, but more again in the short-term explanation of our seismic observations. But if you look at the um, early evidence from geochemistry, from geodynamics, from topography of the seafloor, uh, we uh, understand that the major control for what gives plates its plate-like behavior, strength and long time scale is temperature. And so that's my, you know, um, my, the way we, uh, I summarize it as new results come out. I hope that clarifies uh, uh, the issues uh, that might sometimes be raised and the paradoxes that might sometimes kind of crop up if, you, if we look too closely at the, at the uh, geophysical observation. Thank you, Toto. I think, so I think we're about to get kicked off. I think the session is about to close automatically. So um, thank you everyone so much. And I just want to draw your attention to the chat where Jim has, um, has uh, pointed out that Hannah Mark, who's somewhere here, um, has a paper about to come out with the S-wave receiver functions for NOMA, which, which um, possibly also include uh, great evidence for that some sort of dehydration boundary in the oceans, or at least some velocity boundary that you can interpret in that, in that way. Hannah, you, is that a fair? You can nod. I think we're about to get kicked off right now. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, thank you all so much. I don't want anyone to get cut off mid-sentence, so I think we'll close the session there. Thanks for your attendance.